every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new synaptic connections. And as you begin to leave imprints in your neurological tissue as a result of your interaction in the environment, the next thing is that you're going to have an opportunity then to apply that information, to personalize it, to demonstrate it. And a certain people, group of people, will get their behaviors to match their intentions, to get their actions equal to their thoughts. They'll step out into the unknown and they'll try it. And when they do, they'll have a new experience. An experience then enriches the brain, reorganizing more circuits than what you understood physiologically. But the moment those neurons string into place, the brain makes a chemical, and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And the moment you feel unlimited, the moment you feel like a patient parent, the moment you feel abundant, the moment you feel free, now you are teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. So we can say knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body. And in that moment, you're beginning to embody the truth of that philosophy, of that theory. And you're literally signaling new genes in new ways. And you are rewriting your biological program. But if you've done it once, it must mean you can do it again. And if you can repeat any experience over and over again, you are going to neurochemically condition your mind and body to begin to work as one. And when you've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it as well as the mind, now it's becoming innate in you. It's second nature. It's easy. It's familiar. It's who you are. As a matter of fact, you've practiced it so many times that you don't even have to consciously think about it because it's becoming a subconscious program. So our job is to go from philosopher to initiate to master, from knowledge to experience to wisdom, from mind to body to soul, from thinking to doing to being, to learning it with your head, practicing it with your hands, and knowing it by heart. The next step in breaking the habit of being ourselves is understanding how important it is to get the mind and body working together and to break the chemical continuity of our guilty, ashamed, angry, depressed state of being, resisting the body's demand to restore that old unhealthy order isn't easy, but help is only a thought away. It is essential to unmemorize an emotion that has become part of your personality and then to recondition the body to a new mind. It's easy to feel hopeless when we realize that the chemistry of our emotions has habituated our bodies to a state of being that is too often a product of anger, jealousy, resentment, sadness, and so forth. After all, I've said that these programs, these propensities are buried in our subconscious. The good news is that we can become consciously aware of these tendencies. For now, I hope you can accept that to change your personality, you need to change your state of being, which is intimately connected to feelings that you've memorized. Just as negative emotions can become embedded in the operating system of your subconscious, so can positive ones. At one time or another, we've all consciously declared, I want to be happy. But until the body is instructed otherwise, it's going to continue expressing those programs of guilt or sadness or anxiety. The conscious intellectual mind may reason that it wants joy, but the body has been programmed to feel otherwise for years. We stand on a soapbox proclaiming change to be in our best interest, but on a visceral level, we can't seem to bring up the feeling of true happiness. That's because mind and body aren't working together. The conscious mind wants one thing, but the body wants another. If you've been devoted to feeling negatively for years. Those feelings have created an automatic state of being. We could say that you are subconsciously unhappy, right? Your body has been conditioned to be negative. It knows how to be unhappy better than your conscious mind knows otherwise. You don't even have to think about how to be negative. You just know that it's how you are. How can your conscious mind 
control this attitude in the subconscious. Some maintain that positive thinking is the answer. I want to be clear that by itself, positive thinking never works. Many so-called positive thinkers have felt negative most of their lives, and now they're trying to think positively. They are in a polarized state in which they're trying to think one way in order to override how they feel inside of them. They consciously think one way, but they are being the opposite. When the mind and body are in opposition, change will never happen. By definition, emotions are the end products of past experiences in life. When you're in the midst of an experience, the brain receives vital information from the external environment through five different sensory pathways, sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch. As that cumulative sensory data reaches the brain and is processed, networks of neurons arrange themselves into specific patterns reflecting the external event. The moment those nerve cells string into place, the brain releases chemicals. Those chemicals are called an emotion or a feeling. I use the words feelings and emotions interchangeably because they are close enough for our understanding. When those emotions begin to chemically flood your body, you detect a change in your internal order. You're thinking and feeling differently than you were moments before. Naturally, when you notice this change in your internal state, you'll pay attention to whoever or whatever in your external environment caused that change. When you can identify whatever it was in your outer world that caused your internal change, that event in and of itself is called a memory. Neurologically and chemically, you encode that environmental information into your brain and body. Thus, you can remember experiences better because you recall how they felt at the time they happened. Feelings and emotions are a chemical record of past experiences. For example, your boss arrives for your performance review. You notice immediately that he looks red-faced, even irritated. As he starts speaking in a loud voice, you smell garlic on his breath. He accuses you of undermining him in front of other employees and says he has passed you over for a promotion. In this moment, you feel jittery, weak in the knees and queasy, and your heart is racing. You feel fearful, betrayed, and angry. All of the cumulative sensory information, everything you're smelling, seeing, feeling, and hearing, is changing your internal state. You associate that external experience with a change in how you're feeling internally, and it brands you emotionally. You go home and repeatedly review this experience in your mind. Every time you do, you remind yourself of the accusing, intimidating look on your employer's face, how he yelled at you, what he said, and even how he smelled. Then you once again feel fearful and angry. You produce the same chemistry in your brain and body as if the performance review is still happening because your body believes it is experiencing the same event again and again. You are conditioning it to live in the past. Let's reason this a bit further. Think of your body as the unconscious mind or as an objective servant that takes orders from your consciousness. It is so objective that it doesn't know the difference between the emotions that are created from experiences in your external world and those you fabricate in your internal world by thought alone. To the body, they are the same. What if this cycle of thinking and feeling that you were betrayed continues for years on end? If you keep dwelling on that experience with your boss or reliving those familiar feelings day in and day out, you continually signal your body with chemical feelings that it associates with the past this chemical continuity fools the body into believing that it is still re-experiencing the past. So the body keeps reliving the same emotional experience. When your memorized thoughts and feelings consistently force your body to be in the past, we could say that the body becomes the memory of the past. If those memorized feelings of betrayal have been driving your thoughts for years, then your body has been living in the past 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. In time, your body is anchored in the past. You know that when you repeatedly recreate the same emotions until you cannot think any greater than how you feel, your feelings are now the means of your thinking. 
And since your feelings are a record of previous experiences, you're thinking in the past, and by quantum law, you create more of the past. Bottom line, most of us live in the past and resist living in the new future. Why? The body is so habituated to memorizing the chemical records of our past experiences that it grows attached to these emotions. In a very real sense, we become addicted to those familiar feelings. So when we want to look to the future and dream of new vistas and bold landscapes and are not too, distant reality, the body whose currency is feelings, resists the sudden change in direction. Accomplishing this about faces the great labor of personal change. So many people struggle to create a new destiny, but find themselves unable to overcome the past memory of who they feel they are. Even if we crave unknown adventures and dream of new possibilities ahead in the future, we seem to be compelled to revisit the past. Feelings and emotions are not bad. They are the end products of experience. But if we always relive the same ones, we can't embrace any new experiences. Have you known people who always seem to talk about the good old days? What they're really saying is, nothing new is happening in my life to stimulate my feelings. Therefore, I'll have to reaffirm myself from some glorious moments in the past. If we believe that our thoughts have something to do with our destiny, then as creators, most of us are only going in circles. You gotta go out into life and try it out. Okay, I've changed my internal state. You could have a great meditation and connect. Your heart could open. This happened to me. You could open your heart. You'd be amazing. You feel like the day is invincible. And you get up, and then the rest of your day, you're unconscious. The, the, the 15 hours of your day. So you're gonna weigh one hour of being in a different state of being against 15 hours of you being unhappy and rushing and in a program. Mm. So then, how many times? do we have to forget until we stop forgetting and start remembering? That's called change. How many times do we have to go unconscious to the point where we no longer go unconscious and we stay conscious? That's the moment of change. Now, if you're truly out of the bleachers and you're on the playing field, and this happens to a lot of people in our work, they say, you know, I really believe that this is the truth. I really believe that you mm -hmm. could heal yourself. I really believe you could change your life. I've seen the testimonials. I just never believed that it could happen to me. Now this is a big moment. Now you're really stepping on the playing field. So a person who starts doing their work, they're not, they're not interested in healing. The true, the person who's truly interested in this work, they understand that the only way they can heal is that they have to change. They're not saying, I'm going to wait for my wealth or my healing to happen in order for me to feel grateful and be joyful in life. They're saying, if I feel grateful, my healing's going to begin, right? If I, if I feel more whole, then there should be some change in my gene expression. So they've studied the content, they've studied the information, and now it becomes extremely practical. So they may have a great meditation, and we've seen this happen to many people. They sleep better. They have less pain, they have more energy, but their blood values never change. Now they don't say, oh, I feel better, but I'm failing, this doesn't work. They say, what is it about me that's stopping this from completely healing? Okay, how am I mm -hmm. in my waking day? Oh. The moment you begin to ask that question, you turn on the frontal lobe, and the frontal lobe is the seat of your conscience. Now the moment you start Looking at, at the end of your day, how did I do? This is such an important question. How did I do today? Mm. Did I fall from grace? When did I lose it? And who did I lose it with? If I had another opportunity, how would I do it differently? They'll tell you. I've, I've seen them stand on the stage and tell their story and say, I had to start really watching myself in my life. Yeah. How I was emotionally responding to my ex. How I was emotionally responding to my financial problems. I had to really, really pay attention to that. And that takes an enormous amount of energy and an enormous amount of awareness yeah. to stop the program, right? So you forget and you go, damn, I went unconscious there. Now you didn't lose, you didn't fail. You just became conscious. Now, if you keep becoming so conscious of your unconscious states, you're, you're outside the program. You're only in the program when you're unconscious. Yeah. The moment you're conscious, you can objectify your subjective self. So you can see yourself through the eyes of someone else. So the learning process 
comes from the mistake. The yeah. brain learns by mistakes and surprises. I, I've made enough of them in my life. It's just whether you're going to do it again. Yeah. You want to do it again, you're back in the habit, back in the routine. If you say, this is it. The next time that happens, I am not going to do that. Not for anybody else, but because those emotions actually my response to that person or that circumstance is actually weakening the organism. Yeah. Is that person, that circumstance worth it? So then it's evolution. It's evolution. The challenge then has to be met with a greater level of mind.